Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, You Don't Need No Stinking Test Cases, with Robin Goldsmith. Before we get started, I'm going to give you a short intro on our company and our house rules today and our participants. Uh, this webinar is presented by XBO Soft, which was founded in 2006. We do Q&A consulting and software testing for companies in various industries from healthcare to finance, improving the quality of their software. We do that from offices in San Francisco, Beijing, and Amsterdam. And we'll move on to the house rules for today. All of our participants today are muted. Uh, questions uh, will be uh, posted on chat. We'll try to field them throughout the webinar. Go to the chat screen on the right side of your panel, and we'll try to field those throughout the webinar and as well uh, at the end, depending on time. You can also post your questions on Twitter, so feel free to post them at XBOSoft. Our event hashtag today is at uh, hashtag test case tips. We'll try to field those as well or email you answers directly or answer them in our blog. The webinar today will be recorded and after the webinar you'll receive an email where you can find the location of the webinar posted on YouTube as well as a slideshow. So to introduce you to our participants and speakers today. First we have Phil Liu, our CEO and founder of ExpoSoft. Myself, Carla Smith, I'm Marketing Manager at XBO Soft. And Phil, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Carla. Um, Robin, it's great to have you here. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. This afternoon, I mean. So I ran into Robin uh, at the last uh, Better Software West Conference, and we've known each other for quite a while, but we're able to catch up. and. You know, I was thinking about Robin, and he did a presentation on software requirements, and um, we recently had a webinar with Sri Lu on test cases, and um, Robin was on that webinar and as a participant or as an attendee, and we had a discussion about test cases afterwards, and uh, contrary to what Sri Lu thought, um, Robin has many different opinions on test cases, so I thought it would be a great idea to have you here to talk about that, Robin. Um, well, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I guess I'll give you a, a brief introduction here. You know, Robin's kind of famous, has written many books as well as uh, many articles on, on online websites and so forth. And um, Robin is known as an expert in uh, requirements and using requirements as a basis for testing. And, and Robin works with uh, a lot of high level management in various companies. And uh, we're just really glad to have you here, Robin. And I'll let you. I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, uh, Phil said that uh, we've known each other for a while, but we've known each other virtually, and uh, we only met in the flesh uh, just a few <laughs> weeks ago at the Better Software Conference. But it seems like we're going to be crossing paths quite a bit. We're both going to be featured presenters at the SQTM conference in San Diego in September. And uh, uh, so I encourage you all to uh, look up uh, that, qualitymanagementconference.com, uh, see the exciting things that are being presented there. San, now, Diego, San Diego is not a bad place to be either, huh? Geez, you know, it it is kind of pretty. <laughs> it uh, and the the conference uh, is at a hotel that's uh, like right on the water, right at a marina. I mean, it's just gorgeous there. So, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of amazing that anybody actually goes to any of the meetings. <laughs> and maybe they don't. <laughs> but it it's a it's a lovely place. Okay. Well, let's, let's get started here. So the title of this presentation is we don't, You Don't Need No Stinking Test Cases. And many of you may recognize that as a, a takeoff on the, the very frame, famous phrase from uh, We Don't Need No Stinking Badges uh, from the very classic film, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Now, it turns out 
that we don't need no stinking badges is not actually in the movie. The, the actual quote is what we're displaying here, badges, we ain't got no badges, we don't need no badges, I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Um, so like so many things, uh, quotes get distorted a bit. At any rate, uh, here's why I would say that we are here, and, and Phil mentioned that this is kind of a follow-on from uh, a presentation a couple of weeks ago about test cases that presented a, a particular perspective on them and I, I you know think that there are some other ways to look at things that we need to be conscious of so first of all test cases are the fundamental unit of work of testing and there are many misunderstandings about test cases uh, and Unfortunately, many of those misunderstandings are not recognized, which makes them even more of a problem. It exacerbates them or magnifies their impacts. One of the common misunderstandings about test cases is that they people think that a test case must be written and more specifically written in some particular format which is typically a high overhead scripted format. And then there are a bunch of other people that think that they don't need test cases at all. And uh, clearly that's, uh, uh, you know, diametrically opposed. So I'm going to suggest an approach that I think uh, is going to, you'll find, hopefully you'll find, to be more accurate and more appropriate and more helpful. So let me ask a simple question. You can nod, raise your hand, whatever. Uh, is getting enough effective test cases an issue for you? Okay. So for a lot of people, the the deal breaker word is effective. That a lot of people have many more test cases than they can handle, but getting the right test cases, getting the ones that are needed or most important, that's where the challenge is. And so what I hope we can come out of this session with is an understanding of the essentials of test cases and specifically four keys for making them more effective. And I want you to be able to understand about low overhead test case formats because I think you, you will, will see that you can get a lot of benefits out of them and realize that the format of the test case is the tip of the iceberg that if you've overlooked a test, it doesn't matter what format it might be in because you've overlooked it. And that there are ways to cut down on the number and importance of test cases that have been overlooked. Okay. Now, being aware of these things is a start. We're only going to be here for an hour. And so you're not going to get more than five or ten years of experience in the next hour, obviously. So one of the things that I want to do is try to give you a little bit of guidance so you can move forward uh, to uh, apply some of these ideas and, and work on them and, and develop your effectiveness. So we want to look at what a test case is. We want to look at high overhead formats contrast those with low overhead formats, and then look at identifying and focusing on the more important tests, especially the ones that are often overlooked. So let me share with you an experience that I had a couple of years ago. I was reading a book on testing. I know this is hard to imagine, but there are such things, and they're, you know, not always the most scintillating reading, I'll give you that. But I was reading a book on testing, and the author described a one-page form 
that the author said should be filled out for each test case. And what this form was doing was giving not the test case itself, but all kinds of information, descriptive information about the test case, the ID and uh, cross-referencing and, and so forth. And so I said to myself, gee, that sounds like an awful lot of writing. Maybe this author means something different by test case from what I'm thinking of. So in a, in a rare bit of, of tactful diplomacy, instead of confronting the author, I put together a little survey. And I listed, I don't know, a, a half a dozen testing terms, including test case. And then I sent this survey to a dozen or so other testing instructors and speakers and authorities of various types, including the author of the book, and said, would you please tell me how you define each of these terms? And when I got the answers back, even though the, the answers were not identical, they all pretty much said that a test case consisted of inputs and or conditions and expected results. Now, some people said inputs and left out conditions. Some people said outputs or changes to stored data and outputs and stuff like that rather than expected results. But everybody pretty much said that a test case is input and or conditions and expected results. Now, in addition, some people said, oh, and you need to have preconditions and procedural information, how you set up your environment and so forth. But everybody pretty much agreed on this. And so I said to myself, because I was still in the mode of talking to myself, I said, well, if everybody defines a test case essentially the same way, then maybe it's not how you define it that matters. Maybe the thing that makes a difference is how that is interpreted. And so what I did was put together a different survey and sent it back to the same group of people. By the way, if you're interested, you can read more about this. It was uh, I wrote it up in an article for searchsoftwarequality.com. Was picked as the top tech uh, tip of the uh, of the year. So here's the way that here's the way that the survey worked, or that I changed it. I said, here is a test for entering an order for a customer. And I said, I think that this test can be viewed in five different ways. I said, you could view it at the A level, where the whole thing is one big test case. Okay? Or you could view it at the B level, where where the uh, blue bees are, and you'll see that there's a second slide, and there's a total of seven test cases if you view it at the B level. Or where the pink C arrows are, there are 14 of those, or where the reddish D arrows are, there are 20 of those, or where the light blue E arrows are, there are 24 of them. And so you can see here's the second page, and there's where all those counts come from. So what I would like you to do real quickly is uh, make a judgment, make a quick judgment. Is this A, 
one big test case, B, seven test cases, C, 14 test cases, D, 20 test cases, or E, 24. And if you would, write your answer down so that you don't forget it and type it in to the chat. And we're going to ask Phil to uh, count up those uh, uh, answers. And don't be influenced by what other people are chatting. Okay. So make your decision there. I'll bring down so you can see the second page once again. So is it A, B, C, D, or E? So are we getting any answers there, Phil? That's, that's certainly a lot of counting. No, I think it's too much counting. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, and going across the screens, I think. It, uh, it's, okay, uh, too much counting in terms of how many people are answering A, B, C, or D? <laughs> no, too much counting for the audience to do uh, across they the... Don't they don't have to count anything. All they have to do is decide A, one big test case, B, seven test cases, C, 14 test cases, D, 20 test cases, or E, 24 test cases. Yeah, they I... don't have to count them up. Okay. I've counted the arrows for I would say C. Okay, well, let, let's find out what the other people have to say. Okay. So don't be influenced by Phil. Um, he, he may be the boss, but uh, he's only one vote here, and we've got 45 well, people or something. Looks like uh, <laughs> a lot of people are picking different ones. We've got uh, a few Bs. we got uh, a few As, a few Cs. It's, it's kind of all over the map. Gee, what do you know about that? So here we've got people presumably all using roughly the same definition of what a test case is. And yet, when confronted with a physical test case, how they interpret what a test case is is all over the place. So it's not that the, any one of those answers is better than any other. The issue is that if you're working with somebody and you say A and they think E, you've got big miscommunication problems. <laughs> and the fact is that somebody says, oh, gee, that's, uh, that test is going to take an hour. And somebody else says, oh, no, it should only take five minutes. Well, the reason that they're so far apart is probably because they've got different conceptualizations, different interpretations. So deciding in your group, the people who have to work together, what it is that people mean by test case, I would suggest is a pretty important starting point. And a lot of folks just use this exercise uh, to, uh, uh, first of all, get a baseline for where the group is, and then to uh, uh, use that as a basis for developing consensus. Because until you've at least got a fundamental consensus on what you're talking about, you're going to have total uh, miscommunications. Is that making sense, folks? So this is this is pretty eye-opening for a lot of people. Okay. So I guess now, I guess really the question is the question is how detailed does a test case have to be or should it be? Well, but the answer is that that's not the question. The question is what do people think it needs to be? Right. Okay. And in your organization, you might feel that C is the important one, and somebody else says A, and somebody else says E. It's not that they're right and you're wrong or vice versa. It's that when people don't have a consistent common understanding, and especially when they don't realize they don't have it, then they're in line for trouble. So a test case is inputs and or conditions and expected results, period whether or not they are written. They don't have to be written. Okay? 
and they don't have to be in any specific format or any particular level of detail. So writing does provide some advantages because when you write things down, it helps you to avoid forgetting. Okay? If things are written, it's going to be easier to share them among the other people and you can repeat them and reuse them. You can review them. You can refine them. You can use the written tests to guide what you're doing and to track what you've done. So there are a lot of benefits to writing things down. Okay? But you can have a test case that doesn't get any of those benefits that is still a test case. A test case is what gets executed. It's somebody enters an input or establishes a condition, a combination of those. It produces a result, and you compare that result to the expected result. Okay. That's what a test is. Okay. If it's written, it adds some strength. If it's not written, it's still a test case. Now. Well, there are yeah go ahead yeah robin i was just thinking though that you know it says you have a comment that it does not need to be in any specific format i, I can certainly agree with that um, i think though that it would be helpful for organizations to have a consistent format um, you know if you if you're used to driving a car with the steering wheel on the left hand side and everybody just puts the steering wheel in different places then it's going to be very difficult for different testers within an organization to to drive. I agree. I different agree. levels of expertise as well. Right. right. So so once again, consistency that everybody's got the same understandings is more important in many instances than the particular format that is used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the fact is that automobiles have developed a fair degree of standardization. Okay. You point out that the steering wheel is in a particular spot in this country and a different spot in, in the UK. Uh, so, you know, in this, in this uh, we drive on the right-hand side of the road here, and in the UK they drive on the wrong side of the road. That's a joke. <laughs> Everybody can laugh. I'm okay. laughing. I'm laughing. It doesn't matter right side or left side is not the distinguishing factor that there's nothing God given necessarily that says one side is better than the other it's that everybody who drives drives on the same side okay that's that's the important part now I think you're going to find that there are advantages and disadvantages to different formats so there are a number of people, uh, very prominent people, who are advocates of exploratory testing. So Kim Kaner, who's, who's the author of the biggest selling book on testing, is now a professor, um, describes an experiment that he did where he gave the same script to experienced testers and inexperienced testers. And he found that the experienced testers found two or three times as many errors as the inexperienced testers using the identical scripts. And any of you who are experienced, can, I'm pretty sure, can guess immediately why that is. Because the inexperienced testers simply followed the script, uh, some, perhaps even blindly, and the experienced testers looked beyond it. They looked at the context, they said, what if this happens, and so forth. And so the exploratory testing community uses that as a basis for saying, therefore, don't waste time writing all that stuff, just go test, because the experienced testers are just going to be much more effective than the inexperienced testers, and the time that you spend writing those scripts actually interferes 
with um, finding uh, many of the defects that the experienced testers find. So there are a lot of exploratory testers who don't have written tests who thinks that that means they don't have test cases. And I just want to reiterate, they've got test cases. They're entering inputs, they're getting actual results, they're comparing them to expected results. If those things are not written down, they've saved themselves a small amount of effort and possibly cost themselves some other things because they don't get some of those advantages of writing things down. Now, I would suggest that exploratory testing has a number of issues. It is a useful technique. But the fact is that when we look at where most defects come from, they come from the design. They're design errors, not coding errors. And by definition, exploratory testing, you don't get into exploratory testing until the code is already written and executable. Okay? And so consequently, in terms of exploratory's ability to be helpful in preventing errors, catching them when they can be fixed easier, Exploratory testing doesn't get involved until far after that. I would suggest that writing can be helpful, but that you've got to write in ways that are helpful, which means you have to write economically and effectively, and don't get hung up on things that are just writing for the sake of writing. So write no more than is useful, but no less. And the big difference that I have with the exploratory folks is that they advocate using exploratory testing as their primary, often their only, test technique. And I think exploratory testing is much more valuable and much more effective as a supplemental rather than a primary method. Okay. Now, a lot of folks, including a lot of folks in the exploratory world, seem to think that there's only one format for a test case and that that format is uh, a, typically referred to as a script and includes a lot of embedded keystroke level procedure within the test case. And a lot of people feel that this is absolutely essential because it makes that test uh, able to be repeated precisely. And that people think, well, that's real good because then we can let somebody with negligible skill and negligible knowledge and negligible cost execute these tests and they'll execute them identically. So I think that those presumptions all need to be challenged. First of all, if you are really concerned about precise repetition, an automated test execution tool can precisely repeat a test forever and ever and ever and ultimately execute it faster and cheaper and certainly more reliably than a human being. So if precise repetition is your objective, I would suggest moving away from humans toward automation. Now there are a lot of other issues. So a lot of people spend a lot of high priced time, skilled tester time, uh, uh, writing and creating these uh, uh, high overhead tests. Okay. And the longer that it takes you to write an individual test, the fewer tests that you're going to end up having in a given amount of time. And so 
you're actually ending up with fewer tests the more time that it takes to write a given test. And the more time that it takes to write a given test, the more time it will take you to maintain it or uh, uh, update it if something changes. All of this upfront time really does not help in automating. It doesn't facilitate the automating at all. And what you're doing is creating tests that are not very effective because no real user would execute that test in the same way that that uh, low-priced test executor would. The real user is going to use the system to do whatever it is that they need to do. They're going to be guided by their skills and knowledge and familiarity and so forth. And these types of high overhead keystroke level procedural tests simply create a mindless step-by-step knee-jerk type testing. And it basically assures finding the least amount of errors. Well, because uh, Robin, why not just write these test cases just like an end user would use the test the software to begin with? Funny you should mention it. Okay. However, that's not what money or many, if not most, people think they have to do when they write a test case. They're writing tests to be executed by somebody who knows nothing, and they're not creating the conditions that would actually occur. And what happens is that these tests are actually the least likely to reveal errors because, as Kem Kaner found out, when people follow this very narrow path, they don't find very much. They only find precisely what that procedure leads them to. That's why the, the more experienced testers don't just limit themselves to that test. So let's look at four keys to effective testing. First of all, we want to define correctness independently of actual results. Correctness, that's your expected results. So you define, uh, you run a test, you get actual results. What do you compare them to? Compare them to the expected results, your definition of correctness. If you have not defined your expected results, and then you get actual results, you're almost certainly going to assume that whatever the actual results are, must be right. So your test is really not very effective. And if you run your tests, get the actual results, and then try to define correctness, well, you're going to be guided by the actual results. So you need to define correctness independently and before getting those actual results. And, oh, by the way, you actually have to know what the right answer is. You've got to define the expected results correctly. It's amazing how many people get actual results, have expected results, and don't make the effort to check or compare whether the actual and expected results match. If you don't compare, it's real easy to miss things. There are a lot of testers who rely on the system blowing up to tell them there's a problem. And if the system doesn't blow up, it still gives a wrong answer, they often miss it. And then the fourth key to effective testing is a little bit different because it relates to the issue of things falling through the cracks. And there's a, a simple 
technique for helping catch more of the things that ordinarily get overlooked, and that's to follow independent guidelines. Now I use the example of going to the supermarket with a shopping list. If you go with a shopping list, you're going to end up having different purchases from what you end up when you go to the supermarket without a shopping list. When you go without a shopping list, you typically end up buying and spending more and often failing to purchase what you have went to buy. You go for the eggs and the milk and you come back with uh, People Magazine and uh, candy bars and all kinds of other stuff. So a shopping list is a form of an independent guideline, something that exists that help for some other purpose that helps us know what to look for. So let's look at a couple of simple examples. So we enter customer number one, two, three. The answer comes back John P. Jones. Right or wrong? What do you think, Phil? Is John P. Jones right or wrong? What do you need to know? Okay. So you need to know what the right answer is supposed to be. It's supposed to be Jones, comma, John P., period. So John P. Jones looked just great if you didn't know what the right answer was supposed to be. We enter a new customer's name and address. Screen comes back with the fields cleared for entering the next one, right or wrong. Well, it should say added. We buy 10 widgets for $14.99, right or wrong. Ah, seems right. Well, you got to know what the right answer is. There's supposed to be tax on that. Now, these are simple things that experienced testers mess up because they take things for granted. Less experienced testers probably are going to mess them up even more. So a test case, as we said, is an input, and input or inputs and or conditions and expected results. So for instance, inputs, operator enters a customer number in this location over here. Expected result, the system looks up the customer in the database and displays the customer name in that location over there. But what else do we need to carry out that test? We need data. We need data values. Now, a test case specification, okay, many people have test cases in this format. And what that means is, that as they're executing the tests, they're going to have to keep interrupting their train of thought to identify the data values. And that creates each thing as an exception, so that increases the uh, uh, likelihood of errors. And maybe there are only particular people who can find the data. Maybe you can, or maybe you need somebody else. So another thing to consider is to define the data values, inputs the customer number, expected results the customer name. Okay. Now notice, we're not combining these, we're defining the test case specification. We only need to define that once, but we might have a dozen different data values that are all going to relate to those same specification conditions. I would suggest that that's a low overhead test case. There's no procedure specified. Similarly, test scripts, a sequence of inputs and expected results. Okay. You could consider this all to be, or to be uh, a six individual simple test cases or together as a single complex test case. Regardless, these are low overhead. There's no procedure specified. Or we can have a matrix where there are columns for each field, uh, including for expected results. We could have multiple expected results fields. Each row represents a different combination of those fields. Each row is a separate test case. Once again, now test matrices are more economical when there are 
um, repeated tests of the same data field. A test script, the sequence is more economical when you're going, when you've got navigation going from one screen to another screen. And most people will have a combination. But realize, once again, these are all low overhead test cases. We're not specifying procedure. Okay. And by the way, those of you who are familiar with automation, I think can see that the matrix especially is very adaptable to automation. So think about a typical risk-based testing approach. A lot of us use risk-based testing. It's certainly a good idea. So typical approach. You create a bunch of test cases, you analyze and prioritize the risks that they address, and then you run the higher risk ones more. Okay. Now that's a pretty common approach. I'm sure that many of you do that. Question, consider, let's say you've created 100 test cases. You have time to run only 10 of them. So you've spent all kinds of time writing 90 of them that you're not going to have time to run. That's not good value. And where are the test cases you didn't think of? Oh, well, that's a problem because there's a good chance that the 100 you thought of may not have been the right 100. So just because you think of them, doesn't mean that they're necessarily the most important ones. So I'm going to suggest a different approach for thinking about testing. Now, this approach is described to some extent in IEEE Standard 829. And uh, so Phil uh, had a uh, session, a webinar a couple of months ago on uh, uh, ISO standard uh, 29119, which incorporates a lot of this thinking from 829. So 829 is a controversial standard. It's controversial because a lot of people interpret it as mandating a lot of writing for the sake of, it, of its own sake. I'm going to suggest that instead of thinking, it as, thinking of it as mandating writing, that you think of 829 as giving you a way to organize your thinking. Thinking is high leverage. Writing is low leverage. You write enough to be helpful, no more, but no less. Okay. And I think that this type of thinking, when coupled with agile techniques, can considerably enhance the effectiveness of testing within an agile environment. Now, let me share with you a little bit of the background of 829. IEEE standards are uh, revised or ratified uh, every five or 10 years. I happen to be a member of the working group that developed the 829-2008 version. And the prior version was just text. It was deadly dull. So one of our objectives was to make this one more readable, to include some diagrams. Another was to get away from this uh, attitude that it was simply mandating busy work. I think that we had more progress toward making it more readable. There are some diagrams in the 2008 version. I will tell you that the diagram on the next slide is my diagram. The phrase that we're going to see is my phrase. Neither of them is in the standard, but I think you'll find that they fit the standard. <clears throat> so it's got this phrase. What must we demonstrate to be confident it works? And I would contend that that is the essence of what testing is all about. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you're testing to demonstrate, not to assume. 
and you're testing to give confidence, not certainty, that something works. So the standard suggests four levels of planning and design, test planning and design documents. We start with what is called a master test plan. Master test plan is the project plan for the testing project. And a project plan is not test cases. A project plan is budgets and schedules and tasks and resources and risk analysis and so forth. So the project plan for the testing project is and the testing project is a sub-project within the overall development project. When we are developing the master test plan, we ask what must we demonstrate to be confident it works? And what we must demonstrate to be confident that the overall testing works is that there are a set of what are called detailed test plans for unit tests and integration tests and so forth. These are also project plans, but for smaller sub-projects within the overall development or the overall testing project, which in turn is a sub-project of the overall development project. For each of these, we ask what must we demonstrate to be confident it works. And what we must demonstrate to be confident that a given unit test or integration test or whatever works is that there is a set of features, functions, and capabilities that if they all work would cause us to say that that particular unit test or integration test or system test or whatever works. And for each of those, we can have what is called a test design specification. And for each test design specification, we ask, what must we demonstrate to be confident it works? And what we must demonstrate to be confident that a given test design specification works is that there is a set of test cases, executable inputs and or conditions and expected results. And then along with that, there can be procedures for executing them and various reports, logs and defect reports and summary reports and so forth. So notice that test cases are not the full story. Now this structure gives us some opportunities that we might not have without having an organized structure. So some of these advantages are going to pertain to both reactive or traditional testing and what I call proactive testing. So the structure helps us systematically decompose that big elephant, that, that testing project, into bite-sized test case pieces. And anybody who's familiar with project management knows that one of the fundamental techniques for reducing risk is to break things into smaller, more manageable pieces. Notice, you don't have to have every document. The documents pertain to different sized issues. So if you're only concerned with a particular feature or function or capability, you might only need a test design specification and its related test cases. If you've got something bigger, you might need a detailed test plan. And if you've got multiple detailed test plans, then it's helpful to have a master test plan to tie them all together. So many of us have so many test cases that that becomes a problem. Keeping track of them, duplicating them, losing them, and so forth. So that often reflects not having a good way to organize them. The structure helps us organize large sets of test cases. And if you're like most folks, you end up having to recreate test cases. And when you do that, it's time consuming and error prone. You end up recreating tests you don't need and not cre recreating some that you do need. Well, 
The test design specification serves as a recipe. It tells us what the set of test cases is that we need to recreate so we can use our time much more productively. Now, for a lot of people, these benefits simply from organizing and managing and recreating test uh, cases can offset the effort involved in imposing an organizational structure. There are some advantages that only pertain to proactive testing. So when we are, when we are uh, testing, uh, we're identifying choices. We're identifying risks. If we overlook a risk, we're going to overlook all the tests associated with that risk. And so when we get proactive, we use this structure in a different way. And we use it with some powerful proactive testing techniques that help us spot many ordinarily overlooked risks, starting with large detailed test plan size risks, the ones that turn into showstoppers when they're overlooked. And so we use these techniques to identify more of these large detailed test plan showstopper size risks, then we analyze and prioritize a more thorough set. The ones that are dealing with the highest risks, those are the ones we're going to test more and earlier because we're doing this early in the process. When we're being reactive, testing in a traditional manner, it's usually too late to test the higher risks earlier. So the ones that are dealing with the higher risks, we're going to test more and earlier. The ones that are dealing with the lower risks, we'll test less later, not at all. <clears throat> but we don't stop there, because then for those that we're focused on, we're going to use similar approaches to identify more of the medium size test design specification risks, analyze and prioritize based on those risks, test the ones that are dealing with the highest risks more, the ones that are dealing with the lower risks less, later not at all, and test the higher risks earlier. And then for those that are, we're still focusing on, we then use similar approaches to identify more of the small risks, the test cases, okay. and analyze and prioritize and test those higher risk test cases more and earlier, the lower risk ones less, later, not at all. And then there are some other things that happen. So when we're being proactive, we can use the structure to help facilitate reuse. So if you've ever tried to reuse something that somebody else created, it's very hard because you don't know where to find stuff. You don't know how to make things reusable and how to reuse them. A lot of that is due to the structure. So the structure helps us know where to find things and where to put things. Now, one of the things that we reuse is also reused in traditional reactive testing. That's test cases, such as in regression testing. The other thing that proactive testing is able to reuse are test design specifications. And test design specifications, because they deal with sets of test cases, give us higher leverage. So it's just much more economical to reuse a single test design specification and drag along with it all of the test cases that it deals with than to try to reuse, say, 20 individual test cases. So test design specifications identify sets of test cases they act in a one-to-many relationship with test cases. Test procedures similarly deal in a one-to-many relationship with test cases. So when we recognize these one-to-many relationships, we realize that we can structure our low overhead tests much more economically and only write things one time rather than repeating them. Okay can save a lot of effort creating it, can save a lot of effort uh, uh, maintaining, and 
it feeds a lot more directly into automation. So we've covered an awful lot here, and uh, we'll look for questions in just a second. Hopefully you've seen some test case essentials and uh, the keys to making them effective, inputs and or conditions and expected results, period. We've seen some examples of how we can write things in low overhead manners. Bill kind of alluded to that. That's the way humans actually use systems, not with procedural instructions. And I've suggested that if we take a proactive top-down approach, that we're going to identify a lot of test cases that are ordinarily overlooked. Now, hopefully this is giving you some awareness. Uh, I'll point out that I present uh, consulting and or do consulting and present training in a variety of areas that deal with a lot of the aspects of the development life cycle. The things that we've been discussing are part of what I call proactive testing, and I have a number of uh, uh, web uh, seminars, uh, two and three day seminars on proactive testing, plus a number of other things. So I'm going to hand it over to Carla. Uh, Robin, can you go back a little bit? Uh, there's a question that came in, and I didn't have time to in, inject myself there. But I was one of the questions was from uh, Mike, and Mike was uh, asking about standardization in terms of writing enough to be helpful. Um, you know, he was just uh, had a question on how to objectively implement that. Uh, you know, writing enough to be helpful and not more, and okay. um, I think the answer to that question really depends on the level of expertise of the testers, which is going to be varied across a team, number one. And it's something that you didn't really address in terms of, you know, some people in the exploratory realm, uh, you mentioned Kim Kaner, uh, say, oh, yeah, we need to have experienced testers, blah, 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 and it should be all exploratory and so forth. But the reality is that not all testers are experienced. And we also have to account for employee turnover. Not everybody's going to stay in the same company testing the same software for 10 years. So how do you account for a newbie that comes in and making them productive as soon as possible with high-level test cases that they can't really even understand? Okay. So an excellent question. Who was it, Mike, who asked that? Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Excellent question. Now, I think that when people step back and look at their presumptions about what a test case has to include and has to look like, that hopefully you're in a position now to rethink some of that and to realize that a test case not only doesn't have to be one that can be operated by somebody who knows nothing, but that in fact that may not be an advisable approach. Now, I know that there are people that are going to, you know, scream and yell that the test case has to be one that can be executed by somebody who knows absolutely nothing. Okay? They're not going to believe me. That's, that's their prerogative. Okay? I think that when you step back and look at it, that you really have to question the, the presumptions that that's a valuable way to do testing. I think that you're far better served to write more low overhead test cases and devote the added time or uh, the money that you would have spent writing all of these uh, high overhead test cases in preparing the testers to know enough to test the system in a manner that's reasonably representative of how people would actually use it. I think that's a far better use of your time and energy. Now, I don't think for a moment that exploratory testing necessarily does that. I think exploratory testing may or may not invest in understanding you know, what the system is for. I think that that's one of the weaknesses of exploratory testing is that people say, I'm a good tester, therefore I can test anything, and I don't have to be burdened by all this knowledge. And I think that that's, I think that's short-sighted. But I would I would suggest that you think more in terms of low overhead and 
prepare the testers to be effective and productive rather than trying to force them into this mold where they're you're by definition they're going to be of minimal effectiveness right okay sorry to interrupt you but uh, I thought that was a really good question from Mike and uh, I guess we'll you turn bet. we'll turn over to um, Carla now and let her close up uh, we forward on to the final slide there Thanks, Phil, and thanks uh, so much, Robin, for a terrifically informative session today. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to either um, shoot those to us via Twitter at our hashtag test case tips, uh, today's uh, event hashtag, or send them to us at services at exposoft.com, and we'll continue to answer those questions via our blog on our website, exposoft.com. Uh, we'll um, also be sending you the recording of today's webinar with the slide shortly. And do remember that both Robin and Phil will be the featured keynote speakers at SQTM in San Diego, September 13th to 18th. Thanks so much to everyone again for joining us today and watch for our next webinar coming up in September. Thanks so much. Have a terrific day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robin. Thank you.